Yes. Yeah. So once you got the idea, how did you get into writing the book? Or was that one of that was one of your passions? It was actually. It was one of my passions. Yeah. It was just a pa I, I After I wrote, worked for this woman, right, and traveled around, then my next thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to write a book. And actually, you know, what I said was, your passions are like breadcrumbs that lead you onto the path of your destiny. It doesn't mean that tomorrow you're going to be living your destiny and things can happen. And actually, my path was a little jagged, even though I'm the one who started this whole book off. I mean, it was very interesting. But... One wonderful, fortunate thing happened as I was following my passions was Mark Victor Hansen, the other chicken soup for the soul author, invited me to come and partner with him. And one of the things that we created together was called the Enlightened Millionaire Program. And one day he said, I can't be at our conference today. And there were 500 people, and I had never spoken to 500 people. And he said, would you speak today? I won't be there. And I went, OK. And I had put together the passion test just for me at the time, truly. And I just thought, well, OK, I guess I'm supposed to do this. So I put together the passion test for 500 people. And when I saw that it actually was transforming not only my life, because it was really working for me, but theirs as well, I went, OK, I've got a book. I should write this book. And that's how it started, yeah. Thank you for that question, yeah. And you know, you just go, you just follow your bliss, really, right? Just follow what you love. And what you'll find is that all the people, places, or things start to show up for you. And they truly, magically do. And until you do, until you follow those things that you love, you're going to find that you're always getting yourself kicked. Just like I did when I was working as a disc drive recruiter, because I didn't care about that job whatsoever. I hated it, right? And so... You know, I failed at it miserably, and, and that's the benevolent universe being so wonderful, getting us out of a place we're not supposed to be, because all of us are truly here to do something wonderful and special. Just start with, what do I love? Okay? Very good. Thank you for that, that question. Now, Janet, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have a seat. We're going to take some of the okay. text messages in, some of the callers from around the country. Um, there's an 800 number on the screen. Go ahead and just call that, and we'll invite you into the show. Um, and I'm going to throw out one more trivia question while we're waiting for the calls to come in. So another trivia question is, and uh, I believe you named the least one, probably a couple during the program, name two transformational leaders that Janet had the opportunity to work with, and you had the opportunity to work with a lot, but name two, and again, we'll give uh, a copy of Janet's book as well as a copy of the book from next month. And so, yeah, why don't we grab a seat? Um, we, ha we have our first text message question that just came in. It's on okay. the screen behind us. And the question is, are your passions supposed to be selfish? And if so, is that OK for Marist College? Are your passions supposed to be selfish? I've never looked at it that way. But you could call following what you love selfish. And you know, this is where we all get messed up, truly. Because we think, oh my gosh, you know, if I do that, I'll be selfish. Right? But actually, think about it. When you don't align with those things that you care most about, then you're actually ripping everybody else off. And I'll give, you a, I'll give you a real good example of this. I was giving a seminar, and there was this woman there, and she said, I want to, I, I want to have a dress company, but I have children. And how selfish of me to leave my home and you know, go start a, you know, just go start a company. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Are you ever frustrated or irritable at home? you know, around your kids? And do you ever feel kind of like, gosh, I want to do this and I can't, and it makes you uptight? And she said, yeah, a lot. And I said, well, wonderful environment to bring your kids up in. And I said, so just imagine, just imagine, stay open. Stay open to the possibility that maybe if you did a little, you know, start choosing in favor of that thing that you love to do and also found a way to be with your kids, do you think you might be a little bit happier and more fun to be around when you are with your children? And she said, yeah, absolutely. You know, so many of us think, gosh, how selfish it is to, for me to be doing, you know, what I love because maybe it won't be what is right for someone else. But what I found is that when you truly align with what you love, everybody wins. And when you don't align with what you love, those people around you actually lose. So that's the answer to, my, to that question. Yeah, you know something that I like? Um, it kind of relates to the question, uh, but it's almost something side. Because um, I think.
External fear takes a lot of energy yeah, because you always have to have a gun at their head, um, not a real one, but uh, you know, the old proverbial threat of something at their head. So you want it there. Now what I did was I came up with um, the next thing we want to look at is these are some of the things. If you're unemployed and there's nothing that uh, I can do or there are no jobs out there uh, or I'll never get back to where I was, you can see that you have no internal motivation because the person already is doing, you know, starting with this principle. Now, uh, the, one of the very first questions, and you may want to write this down, is the first question you have to ask people is, do you believe that you can find a job? Now, this is going to be a tricky one. Now, I'll give you an example of this. One more thing we're going to look at up here, and then I'll come back and give you an example of this. There are two words that I ask people uh, that you want to get rid of out of your vocabulary, all right? And they are have to, all right? So you want to eliminate have to. Have to gives you the perception of non-control. The thing that you're putting off doing, the thing that you're putting off doing has a have to in front of it. I want you to look at that. The one thing, everybody in here has something you're putting off doing. And that thing that you're putting off doing, you have a have to in front of. Now, I'm going to ask the question, and then I'm going to ask you, so we'll ask this question. How many here want to lose weight and have been attempting to lose weight and attempting to lose weight? Okay. What weight do you want to be? I'll pick on you. Now, don't, don't tell me what you are. Just tell me what you want to be. 200. You want to be 200. Okay. Are you on a diet now at all? No, no. Really. Okay. So, okay. So, now here's my magic question. Do you believe you can be 200? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Why are you putting it off? I got Jan running back and forth. <laughs> I like watching this, you know. This is kind of fun. Why are I, you putting it off? I guess um these are excuses you get. They care of transportation? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I, get, I get lazy with my, my eating habits at But there's times. no such thing as lazy. There's no such thing as lazy. No, I mean, so like, do you think you control the 200? Have you ever been on diets? Yeah. And what happened? I mess up or I get frustrated or I do the wrong diet. That's what? a big one. I, oh, the wrong diet. Yeah. I may have had wrong training. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See if I were your counselor. Okay, uh, so like, okay, now, what, what, do you have a have to? And you, you don't have to come in. Do you have a have to? Okay, so you have a have to. That may be one of the things. What on the f most, the reason I didn't pick on this is that most of the time I have, like last week I had people, they'll say, do you believe you'll be 200? And they go, I had a lady last week, she goes, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the stuff that you want to start looking for when you're asking a client, do you believe that you can reach your goal? Uh, so we're going to wrap it up. We're going to have a little wrap up. We're going to give everybody a break for, I believe, 10 minutes. Is that it? 10 minute break. And uh, we'll be back and we're going to talk about uh, more about motivation and more about things that clients say. And also uh, we're going to talk at sales and uh, uh, we're going to talk about performance measurement. So we'll see everybody back in about 10 minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions about what we've covered, those little points that we've covered or thoughts? Are we in agreement somewhat? Or, yes, go ahead. We have, we have Jan who's going to run over. <laughs> yeah, hi. I was just uh, had a question about, um, I guess, teaching self-acceptance to, to people, like when they have low self-esteem, mm -hmm. and just the importance of, of accepting yourself for, for who you are. Right. And is that a big focus of that, trying to build that self-esteem? I, Along I think, with motivation? Yeah, I think it is. But I think part of the problem is that we're ignoring that. I, 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 how many here have, like, self-esteem, anything that deals with self-esteem? How many offer? What, what do you offer? I'm sorry. Jan is going to lose a lot of weight here <laughs> running around. We actually have people who volunteer to come in, mm -hmm. life coaches, people right. like that, sure. to actually work with sure. the women. And what? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. And we found that that's been really helpful for them, especially if they're feeling bad about being rejected mm -hmm. uh, by employers. So we try to have them come into the center on a regular basis. That way we can encourage them. And also with the life coaches, they sure. have other techniques that we don't offer sure. at the center. Do you have any of the techniques special that you like or that you can think of? Or am I putting you on the spot here? Well, actually, one of the things that we do is we offer mock interviews. Okay. 
right. and we have actual employers to come in. We have our women to wear an interview suit, uh -huh. research the company online, and they have their resume ready, and we videotape the interviews. Sure. And then we go back with the women and our employers and talk to them about how well they did and offer advice on how cool. they can do better. Well, great. Mm -hmm. Other people offer that stuff? Okay. Well, good. Well, one of the, I, I want to get back to, you said like resume writing, and I jokingly said, you know, if you're depressed, it, resume's not going to really perk you up. But I think it does help in self-esteem. I think that a lot of times clients will go through classes. The, the other thing that I want to mention, I don't really think you can give self-esteem to somebody. I think you can put them in situations, you can do things with them that help them to build their self-esteem, like, like, you know, dressing up day and, um, you know, compliments. I think that that's a big thing is compliments to people, genuine compliments. Um, I, I think that, that that helps a lot with, with the self-esteem. Uh, you know, saying little mantras, uh, you know, like I'm an okay person, although you may not believe it. That's when we get into fake it till you make it uh, type of activity. So, uh, so we want to talk. I think you basically covered it, uh, Carol, during your presentation, but let's go through this again. So the question is, how does a consumer go about getting a copy of Medicaid Managed Care Health Plans for the, in this instance, Westchester area, but for any other upstate area or outside of the New York City area? Well, I think there's a, there's a, there's a couple of things, is, is that um, during the enrollment process, anyone who's being asked to choose a health plan, the packet of information that they have will include the names of the plans in the counties where they live that they have available to them. Um, but in advance of that, I, I, I think that they, they can um, con check out the, the DOH website, go, go back to um, their providers. This is a, a good place for the providers to help to have that list of health plans in the counties, in the areas that you serve available. And, and begin to sort of become, become familiar with them. And again, we are encouraging providers to, to provide individuals with the names of the health plans that, that, they, part, that they are in to their patients. Okay. Thank you for sending your questions in. Uh, let's get to a few more. Um, many of our day health participants utilize Medicaid transportation to access the programs. Will they still be able to do this or will clients access the transportation depend on what managed care okay. plan they choose? And we'll start with uh, Jennifer and Carol, if you want to add any comments. Okay. Um, transportation is, is a benefit in different counties. Are, the benefit package works slightly different. The plans are allowed um, to, to work with the lo each local district and determine whether transportation is in or outside of the benefit package. Um, I understand that there is um, the way the rates are set for the daycare. The daycare that rate includes the transportation, so um, that would be covered as part of the, um, the daycare rate, and that is, a, that is actually a carved out benefit, right? right. So that, um, that daycare rate is, is charged a fee for service, and that rate includes the, the transportation, the non-emergency transportation right. to and from that service. Right. Okay, that, good. I think that's a good question. Okay. Uh, a, a lot of what we've talked about today has to do with getting to the point where mm -hmm. Folks uh, on Medicaid living with HIV will select a plan and not be auto-assigned. But the question that we received is, with auto-assignment, how does the health plan get chosen for the individual? Let's start with Jennifer. All right. Um, the, the, we have a very specific way that health plans are chosen when we, when we auto-assign people. Um, and I think that we can't stress enough, and I think Carol probably said it 10 times during her presentation, <laughs> that it's really important for the each of the providers to work with their own clients to make sure that they, the client ends up in the right plan and that the client is not auto-assigned because auto-assignment is not always the best thing. But when, if somebody doesn't choose a plan, one of the things that we will do is we have quality indicators for all of the health plans based on a lot of different um, criteria. And the health plans that get the auto-assignments are the auto assignments um, are given only to plans who are who rank on the higher end of that of those quality indicators. So if you have a plan that is that we have determined is below average on the quality, they will not get any auto assignments. Okay. Excellent. That's a good thing to know. Uh, the next question relates to New York Medicaid Choice, Carol, which is something that you talked a bit about. So will New York Choice uh, Medicaid oh, Choice be yeah. available for clients who are in LDSS or local Department of Social Services covered counties for basic questions, 
or will assistance need to go through the county? So the question is, when do I call New York Medicaid Choice? When do I call the local Department of Social Services? Okay, I'll take that question. Okay. Um, what happens is, if you're in a, New York Medicaid Choice is in uh, 22 to 23 of our counties right now. And if you live in a county that is utilizing the enrollment broker, which is at this time, New York Medicaid Choice, you will, all of the materials you get will have New York Medicaid Choice's um, phone information. In addition, in each of those counties, we have a New York Medicaid Choice staff person on site at the county to help educate people and help them pick their plans if they happen to be at that, the lo at that local district site. In the non-New York Medicaid Choice counties, the, count, the client's information that they get has information for the local district itself and they would work directly with the local district managed care staff or maybe if they have a case manager at the local district to help them pick that plan. Can they, but the, the, they can get questions answered. Oh, if they, if anyone, like for instance, on the New York Medicaid on the Medicaid application for assistance, New York Medicaid Choices telephone number eight hundred telephone number is there, and that can be used statewide. And New York Medicaid Choice will triage those calls, give out some general information about the mandatory versus voluntary status of the county, maybe what health plans are there, and then they will help refer that call to the local district in in question, so that the local district can help get them enrolled. Um, please speak a little more to what happens after October 1st with individuals who reside outside of a mandatory county. Are they exempt from managed care requirements? In other words, if you looked at that map right. and you were in a county that was that blue, was, was, blue, was <laughs> not a mandatory county, what happens there? Um, uh for people who live in a county that's voluntary, so if you're looking at the map, it's, they, they were the ones pictured in blue, um, currently nothing would change for them. They would, um, on October 1st, they won't get the mailings, they won't be asked to choose a plan, um, they will be able to continue to be seen fee for Now, uh, I received a facts on uh, some other objections. And please, I want to make sure I add validity and adult legitimacy to each objection. The person that called in about the, uh, it's uh, more expensive in Canada, uh, the prices, uh, it's cheaper in Canada rather, that's a price objection. I just had one here that came and says, uh, my present supplier has serviced me for years, why change? That's an objection they get. And the other one is, you're a union yard, you can't service me. And the last one is, not open on weekends. These are objections. I can take care of the last one, be open on weekends. <laughs> now you may laugh, but you know what? That's, if you want to prevent that one, do that. The, your competitors, if they are, you have to do that. Now, my present supplier has serviced me for years, why change? Now, that one person asked the question is, always in mind, everybody's buying from somebody right now. They're not looking saying, please service me. Find out, do a SWOT analysis on your company, and a SWOT analysis strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Do that on your competition and attack their weaknesses. I guarantee you, everybody listen to me, people are doing it on you. I know for a fact the mass merchants are doing it on you. I work with a large mass merchant in the Midwest, not here, and that's exactly what they're doing to the lumber yards. They're doing a squat analysis on you and they're attacking, not you, their lumber yards in the Midwest, they're attacking their weakness. If I were you to over start to prevent this objection about my supplier service me for years, why change? Find out their weaknesses and start solving problems that that current supplier does not have right now. I guarantee you win every time. But you know what most people do? They go after someone else's strengths. That's how you prevent. You've got to think, and it's strategic. Good for you. Good for you. Now, if we could, now I want to start going a little bit further now. Please go to page 15. Sarah, can you please read that? Because there are some excellent, excellent sayings in there. Oh, by the way, we haven't did a hit me in a couple hours. Does everybody remember the hit me? The first hit me is professional selling. And the second hit me, because we need energy, is you're the man. Now, if you notice, can we pan around? Because we have some fresh people in here. We switch groups. You know what? I think I like this group better. <laughs> <laughs> the other group is going to get me for that one. So when I say hit me, I want to hear professional selling, because passion persuades. And the second hit me is you're the man. Starting with you, Mike. <laughs> All right, here we go, and I want everybody to do it. 
First hit me, professional second. Second one is, uh, you're the man. Ready? Hit me! Professional selling! Hit me! You're the man. These are, yeah! <laughs> Please read page 15 for me, Sarah Hebner. Value quotes. Add value or get out of the way. Rick Nin Brent. In the year 2000, what did I say? Add permanent value or get left behind. I'm going to ask this group an elite question. What's the definition of permanent value versus value based on what we spoke about? As a matter of fact, Art, can you put the phone number here again? I'm asking every location. What we've talked about for two hours, what's the difference between value and permanent value that we've talked about for two hours? Does anybody have the answer here? Because there's really no right or wrong answer. The question again is, what's the difference between value and permanent value? What we've talked about for two hours. Talk to me over here. I, uh, Tony, can you bring up the, to Charlie. Big Charlie, Cappy's old seat. Well, once, am I on the mic here? Yes, you are. You okay. are live TV. Well, once again, as uh, pa Paul spoke earlier there, we're a company that's been relied upon for over 100 years, and a permanent value would be value that's everlasting and one thing that we provide to our customers. Okay, very good. That's one. What else? What's the difference between value and permanent value? based on what we spoke about today. Now, there's no right or wrong answer to this. What's the difference between value and permanent value? How about if I give you an example? I'm going to sell you some good windows. But permanent value is I'm going to make sure I educate you how to put the windows in. I'm going to make sure you have a 24-hour access in case there's a problem. I'm going to give you my business card and say, you know what, John? If there's anything else I can assist you with, you call me. You call me anytime because you're my customer. You know what? I know whoever serves best profits the most. You see the difference? I'm not just selling products, I'm selling my entire company. That's permanent value. Anybody can sell windows, doors, and wood. It takes elite to be permanent value, and that's professional selling. Which leads us to our next exercise. Please go to page 16. I'm gonna make you think now. I'm gonna make you think. Sarah, can you please read that for me? Solving problems. Take a product or service that your company provides. Itemize the features or characteristics of the product or service. For each feature of your product or service, list specific problems that it could solve for a client. Do you remember why people buy? It solves problems which makes their life better. I ask you to make a list of the products and services you have. Now I'm giving you an example. If you notice in the left-hand column that has feature product or service, we listed four here. And in the right-hand column, what does it say in the heading there, Sarah? Problems it solves for the client. This is what I want you to start thinking about. What is our product or service? What does it solve? What problem does it solve for the client? People don't buy features and facts. They, pro they buy resolutions to problems, which makes their life better. Start thinking features and facts, what problems it solve for the customer. Here's some examples. Sarah, please read these for me. Next day delivery. The problem it solves for the client, it allows the builder to be more flexible with clients on decision making, allows the builder to relax on schedule requirements and concentrate on satisfying clients, provides builder greater flexibility in scheduling labor, gives the builder an advantage by being able to react to problems or job changes efficiently, increases builder's profitability by allowing him to order continuously, not inventorying materials. Can you think of next day delivery doing all that? Start thinking that because you know what? So will your client, they're gonna say, wow, look at next day delivery. Look how much permanent value you're adding. Read the next one, free kitchen design. Now these are only examples, and guess what? On the next page, I will ask you to do some of your own. Continue. Free kitchen design, the problem it solves for the client, one-stop shopping for the contractor. The contractor can send his customers to the dealer to look at lumber products and kitchen and bath products at no cost. Also eliminates the need for the contractor to do the kitchen design. The lumber dealer takes care of that, so the contractor can do what he does best, build. Free estimating. The builder contractor is best at building. When a dealer provides estimating, they are relieving the contractor of such a task. It is possible more accurate than a contractor's estimate because a dealer has up-to-date pricing in their computer system. Before we do the last one, can anybody here in this room tell me the similarities in the boxes of problems and solves for the client? What are those paragraphs saying? Makes it easier, nicely done, what else? Very good, what's your first name? Nicely done, Walter. Makes it easier. What else do those columns say? Saves the money. Saves the money. What else? Would you say those are Rick Grant and any benefits in a paragraph form? It's either increasing or decreasing something. That's exactly what it is. You don't hear any features or facts in this columns of problems solved for the client. 
It says, here's a problem I'm going to solve for you. I'm going to make your life better. It makes you think. And the last one, Sarah Hebner. Home Strategies Seminar. Oh. The problems it solves for the client. The builder does not have to look for business. Clients are educated and prepared for the process and saves the builder time and money. Recommendation from the lumber company elevates the professionalism of the builder. Lumber company provides a quality assurance to homeowner, which the builder does not need to do. Builder is more profitable because he can concentrate his efforts on building, not marketing. Can you imagine getting customers for your customers? It's such an elite process. As a matter of fact, we have people on the phone right now. We have Merrill Becker on the phone that's going to answer. Merrill, what question are you going to answer? Well, this is in relationship to add value and permanent value. Uh, add value basically uh, with the uh, customer is solving the uh, problem Tell and that particular next. job, whereas permanent value, we feel, is the, uh, you, you, the customer remains permanently with you or remembers you and the company long after the sale is complete. Nicely done. Nicely done, Merrill. Very good. Thank you, Merrill. And the next caller. Very good. Sean from Cape Cod. Tell me, Sean. I think Merrill has a line tapped in here, our room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. But, but, uh, but I've been trying to answer the question as well and the difference between adding uh, uh, overcoming of objections is taking the objections away. I've been it, screaming at the television for 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. Sean, are you telling me value is overcoming objections, permanent value is preventing them? Taking the objections away. I love you, Sean. I love you, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nicely done, Sean. Excellent answer, because you know what? That's the embodiment of this program. Very good. Very good. So... All right, well, that being said, you know what? If we don't add permanent value, you know what generally happens? This next slide right here. Adam, if you could show the one about the... It says, Samson killed a thousand men with a jawbone of an ass. Twice as many sales are killed each day with the same weapon. <laughs> <laughs> what a shame, because they like to overcome objections and close heart! I'm telling you, you solve problems, you make money. There's no exception to that rule. Let's go to page 17, because guess what we're going to do? I want you to start thinking, like we started thinking preventing objections or taking them away. I want you, in this exercise, just think of two products, their features and facts, just two of them. I know there's many columns in your groups, and think, what problem does it solve for the client? Good afternoon, and thank you for attending Turn Your Company or Store into a Selling Machine with Bill Sharp of the Percon Group. My name is Laura Jean Davigno. I'm the NRLA's Director of Education, and we, in partnership with the Lumber and Building Material Dealers Foundation, are delighted to bring you this program today. Um, as you know, this is one of a series of webinars we're doing on LBM uh, things of interest to you. Our next webinar is going to be June 16th. The topic of that webinar will be understanding health insurance to cut costs, a topic I know is going to be of great interest to many of our dealers. We're going to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get started with Bill today. Firstly, um, at the end of Bill's program, we are going to be addressing some questions from the audience. How you're going to convey those to us is by emailing us at studioa at hvcc.edu, that's Studio A at hvcc.edu. Um, we will be putting up that email for you from time to time, but that's how you're going to contact Bill with questions, which will be addressed at the end of the program as we get to them. Um, also, we are going to be sending you a brief survey asking for your feedback on the program at about 3 o'clock when the program is done. We do ask that you take a couple minutes to complete that for us. We, we really, really do listen to your feedback and appreciate that. Don't forget that your registration for the webinar does gain you access to both the online archive and also a DVD if you prefer. Um, let us know if you do need that DVD. So you have access to this program for training use at your site for as long as you need it. Bill's PowerPoint slides are also available to you at the NRLA website. That's nrla.org 
follow the link for um, Education Lumber Library. That's also where you can access our entire archive of webinars. Um, for those that you've already purchased access, you can jump right into them there. If you do need to purchase access to a webinar you haven't seen yet, just let myself or Carolyn in the office know. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Bill Sharp of the Percon Group. Bill's a familiar face to many of our members. He's wowed audiences throughout the Northeast and at our LBM Expo through the years with his sales and improving profitability courses primarily. I'm very pleased to give you Bill Sharp. Thank you for being with us All today, right. Bill. Thank you. It's a joy to be here, and it's, uh, many of you have met me as I've done live seminars for the programs over the last 15 years. Today we're going to be sailing like a rock over a pond. We're going to try and get 50 pounds of nails in a five-pound box in one hour. Let's just get plowing into this real quickly. A couple of things that we need to discuss, and these are not going to last for the next 50 years. But the truth is, during this economic downturn, we do have a situation, and the situation is that you're just going to see less floor traffic. Fewer customers are coming in. However, the customers who are coming in are sending a very clear message. If they truly believe they didn't have the products you needed, uh, you, you weren't doing the kinds of things they wanted done, chances are pretty good that you would see nobody coming in the door. Um, it's also a good time for your company to spend a little time looking at the gross margins that you're generating for the sales that you're making. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about three ways to keep your store healthy. First of all, Get the customers who already love you, already buy from you, already have accounts to buy more. Now that doesn't mean try and con them into buying things they don't need or want, but it does mean being their memory for them. Help them remember the things that go with the job that they're about to do. It makes perfect sense if they're building a deck to remind them of joist hangers and things of that nature. Uh, it also means that we need to up the attention that they're getting while they're in your store and so forth. I would say we need to do several things, but one of those is we need to stabilize those customers who go back and forth. They buy from you and they buy from somebody else. Uh, we just don't know who it is that they're going to buy from today. And if you can get them to settle down a little bit and work with you on a more consistent basis, chances are pretty good the profitability will increase. Let me respond to some of the, the email stuff that's coming in. Um, let's see, any suggestions on incentives for employees to implement what they've learned in the training? One of the easiest one of the easiest in incentives to uh, install in your store, particularly, spit it out here, for your counter salespeople. If you've got people at the counter desk, it should be pretty easy for you to calculate the average transaction value last year in whatever month this is, and just say, okay, the average transaction value is this much. And if you can carry it all the way down to the employee, the average transaction was so much, tell the employee, I'll go with you dollar for dollar. If your average sales were $150, if you get it up to 151, your pay will go up a dollar an hour for all the hours you work in that month. You go up $2 on the average transaction, it goes up two, three and four and so forth. Now that would work for those people who are on some kind of a commission, you know, calculated basis. The one thing I can say about all the other employees the one thing that they most badly need and will cause them to do almost everything you ask them to do is your personal thank you. I don't know if you've read the book uh, In Search of Excellence, one of the 10 best books on management ever written. And in that book, they talked about an idea called MBWA, which stands for Management by Wandering Around. What they're saying is that during the very busiest times in your store, you need to be there not to help them sell or take over sales for them, but to touch them on the shoulder, to say, that was nice. I really appreciate you doing that. That kind of feedback will cause your employees to do almost anything to make it happen again. But you think about what happens. You're gonna be away from the store for the day to attend a conference or a meeting or whatever. You want everybody to be real busy. So you give them 20 things to do and you check back at the end of the day when you get back from the meeting, and they finish 17. Nine out of 10 times, what's the only thing they hear about? It's the three that they did not get done. And it could have been an absolutely impossible day to get those 17 done. They were so proud of themselves for getting the 17 done. But then they didn't hear anything from you. Personal feedback from you, coach, is the heart of the whole matter. You say, is that really that important? Yes, it is. Because in many cases, they haven't had a steady dose of positive feedback. What I see happen in stores that get that kind of feedback, 
really quite simple. The employees want to come to work. 